Hey, everybody. This is Dixie Vogel from The Fool's Journey. Hi there. I'm JC from Shock Therapy. We're glad you could be here with us today. We're talking about garden magic. Yay! Yay! We always have to do the yay. I'm sorry, but that's how we start our shows. Yay! Um, we kind of thought we would start out by talking about some general rules as far as working in your garden, planting things at certain times. At first, I'd like to tell you, I posted on our Woo Woo Wonderful Facebook page today, so if you're not going there, you can go there. But what it is is a link to Farmer's Almanac, which has a lot of wonderful tools um, that you can use for free. also has calendars that you can specify to your area that tells you, according to the Almanac, when the best time is you should plant according to the moon. Uh, so that's pretty cool if you, you, you know, if you want to get around in there and play with that. But in the meantime, we're going to kind of talk about that. There's, there's one big general rule of thumb that I use when planting anything in my garden. And, you know, if, if you have heavy earth in your chart and a lot of water too, chances are you do probably have a green thumb if you haven't discovered it yet. Uh, but that general rule of thumb is that you plant flowers and vegetation that bear crop above ground when the moon is moving from new moon phase to full moon phase. So when the moon is waxing, that's when you want to plant things in the ground that are going to do things above ground. Um, the nights are illuminated by the moon at those times, so that's a good way to remember it. Anything that's going to bear something in the light needs to be planted in the light of the moon. Uh, anything that you have that's going to bear product under the ground, these are your root vegetables, your bulbs also, like your spring flowering bulbs, daffodils, crocus, that sort of thing, potatoes, carrots, those need to be planted when the moon is waning. And you can do that at any time after, um, after the full moon and the day after the full moon until the day of the new moon. So that's kind of how you remember it. If, it's, if we have a waxing moon, like I said, you want to plant things that are going to bear fruit and bear things above the soil. If it's a waning moon, you want to plant things that are going to bear your fruit in the ground, um, in the dark. So that's a good way of, of, of gauging that. You can get even deeper, more deeply into that by looking at the astrology, astrological signs that the moon is in. General rule of thumb of that is you want to plant when the moon is in a water or an earth sign. Our new moon in Taurus was was wonderful for, for getting those seedlings outside and in the ground. Um, also, water moons are wonderful for that, like I said. Your air and fire moons, that would be Libra, Gemini, and Aquarius. For your air moons, for fire moons, you're looking at Leo, Aries, and Sagittarius. What you want to do during those times is weed your garden, do any kind of pruning that you have to do, do any kind of caretaking that you have to do to the ground. I do not plant during those moons. Um, you can you can have some luck with it if you give it a shot, but you know the best time to do that is when the moon is in your earth sign, your Taurus, Capricorn, Virgo, or in your water signs, which is Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, of course. Um, and all of those are, are your prime times for planting. Again, Waxing moon is for things that are going to bloom above ground. Waning moon is things for that are going to bear fruit in the ground. Is that kind of what you go by, Dixie, or, or is there a different model that you follow? No, that's that's basically the idea, um, and that's basic. Honestly, I look it up. But one of the things I love about this topic and this approach to gardening in general is it's just another way to encourage us to be aware of and tune into natural cycles. Um, looking at, you know, which signs are considered fertile and the water signs and thinking, okay, well, where is the moon and is it growing or um, is it, you know, is it waxing or waning? Because it's, um, it, it kind of allows us to go, okay, well, when the moon is waxing, I can also in my everyday life focus on issues that I want to grow and when the moon is waning then I can look at what I want to release and, and cut out of my life a little bit more but I like the whole idea of this is just another way to get in tune with 
nature and the natural cycles. And I take that a little bit further in my personal life in terms of thinking, okay, in the springtime, I want to start new projects. And in the fall time, fall time, as if I don't know the name of the season, in the season of fall, <laughs> I like to um, think about what results that those projects have yield, yielded and, and whatever. But everything we can do, in, in my estimation, to get more in turn, in turn, my mouth is not working today, more in tune with the natural cycle and how things work is a way for us to be more aware of the energy at large and more aware of what's going on in it. Also, you can, you know, you can time your garden and plant your garden um, with the moon cycles, pay attention to what signs the moon are in, you can pay attention to how you feel um, in terms of when the moon is in various signs. So that's something that, that Josie's totally got me sold on since, since we started working with that more frequently and, and talking about that regularly because um, it really helps you be aware of what's going on. It really helps you plan so that your projects and your endeavors have the map, maximum, maximum potential effectiveness. Um, so I really like the whole, th the whole idea of magic gardening even, even from that. But I, yeah, paying attention to what sign it's in, is this fertile? Uh, extra energy for um, earth signs and then of course when it's not a good time for planting um, you you weed you do other kinds of stuff but yeah that's basically my approach too and I think it's it's a good one although a lot of times I'll have to look up okay you know we're in this part of the cycle what is that da 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 yeah. Well, and that makes that makes perfect sense, and and I love how you put it that it it continues that connection to what's going on universally, and that's exactly true. It, you know, if you're paying attention to the phases of the moon in your personal life, why not overlay that with everything that you do? I mean, it just makes it that much more simple. And there's nothing that's going to connect you to Mother Earth and what the reality of our life is. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Josie's coming and going. So with my life, um, as far here we go. As far as organizing it. Ah. Am I back? You were cutting in and out a little. I think you're Is back. It? I hope you're back. Are you back? I think I'm back. Yeah, I got, I got, I got you were talking about how helpful it is to, <laughs> Hi, to, everybody. We're to organize. <laughs> I can't keep my internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fun of a live broadcast, huh? I know, right? What's up with that? I don't hear you. I know, I know. Okay, but you're talking about Can you hear me now? Teams, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting a little lag on the video, but I can, what was, I can hear you. What was going on? Okay. Okay, good. I did talk about being in tune with what's going on and also about how much it helps you in organizing your life. And for some reason, I feel like if I slow down I, my speech, that might help the internet connection. And I have no idea why I even have that inkling, but it, it's just kind of my correlation <laughs> of what's going <laughs> um, But anyway, timing your life and timing your gardening with the phases of the moon will get you more in connection with your emotional body. And your emotional body is, of course, watery. Um, it's ruled by the water signs. It, you produce tears and your body water functions react to the emotions that you're having. It only makes sense that you would pay attention to what the moon is doing because there is documented proof that the moon does affect the water flow on the planet. And how you could justify that that water flow on the planet doesn't include you, whose body is 80% water, is kind of silly. But anyway, we're talking about 
plants. Um, and something that Dixie and I had spoken about out before the show is I wanted to give you something you could do tonight. Um, you know, if you watch the live broadcast and if you decide you want to immediately jump on this gardening bandwagon, you want to try out your green thumb, something that I will be doing tonight um, will be putting out some water to be charged under the full moon. Yes, right this very second we are under a void of course moon. But Moon is into Sagittarius at about 1.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So overnight, it's going to be in full force, and it will be able to charge your water. So you can take your little, I use a mason jar, you can take your little mason jar and set it out under the moon and let it get charged by that full moon power. What you can do with that mason jar full of moon water when you get done, um, which I don't know if anybody that doesn't live in Kentucky still uses mason jars. I'm not really sure, but we've got them plentifully here. Um, what you can do after that water is charged is you can actually water your plants with it. You can put it in a spritzer. One of my one of my favorite remedies for aphids and, and so forth on my roses is to put a little bit of moon water in a spritzer with about two drops of dishwashing liquid. You don't want to spray this on the plant during the heat of the day, but rather when the sun is off of it, you can spray the plant with this and the little bug feet get on it and they don't like it. So they kind of steer clear of it once you once you spray that dishwashing liquid on there. The only problem is when it rains, it washes it off, so you have to reapply it. But you're not killing anything, you know? You're not poisoning the planet. And it all starts with something as simple as moon water. Something else I do to kind of incorporate some magic into my um, daily gardening practices is to take my gardening tools, clean them up real good, oil them up so that they are water and, and rust resistant, and lay them out underneath the full moon so that they can be charged and ready to go when you're ready to use them again. And it's a great moon for that because we are under Scorpio moon. That's a water moon, so that's very fertile. And I, I like the way that, that you bring up the point about um, kind of incorporating everything or, or bringing it all together in other ways to bring the energy of what you're doing to the garden um, it, or the, guard, the activity of gardening. Because all of these kind of things, whether it be, okay, well, these are my garden implements that I've charged underneath the moon or whether it be the mindfulness and the intention that you start out with, when you go out to work in your garden, you know, if, if your intention is, I want to grow, you know, I, I want to tend to the earth, I want to get grounded, I want to grow and heal and get in tune with nature, in tune with my spirit, and I, you know, I, I want to commune with the earth. And everything that you do with that intention, whether it be, um, charging up your gardening tools, making some special water, thinking about how, okay, well, I'm going to use this instead of insecticide because I want this to be a nourishing thing for the earth, you know, this mixture, whatever. All of these things kind of add to the overall experience. Um, and in fact, I like to think of my garden space as kind of a little sacred area. You know, I might put gemstones in, in my pots. I talk to my plants. I have intention when I'm watering them, okay, I want this to feed you, and I want this to help you grow, you know, you bring me lots of joy, thank you, I commune with my plants, and it all becomes part of the experience, you know, a garden would be a great place to put a little statue of your favorite spirit animal totem, which nobody's going to think anything of, people will not call you crazy for having your frog, or your bird statue, or your butterfly, or whatever in the garden. Right? So it can be a little private kind of thing, which is kind of the way that I do it. Um, well, not all of my woo-woo is private, obviously, but in terms of some of my gardening activity it is. But I, I like the whole concept of this is an extension of your life. This is the extension of the energy that's in the time. And when you're, when you're doing your activities, when you're working with your tools, you know, because, I mean, what Josie was suggesting is essentially blessing your gardening tools under the Scorpio full moon and infusing them with the energy, infusing them with the intention that they, you know, nourish the plants. I mean, it's making the entire process of mindful activity as opposed to, oh, okay, i got to water the plants. 
So I, I really like that approach. I think that it's awesome. But anyway, I had to interject that. Well, and you did great because what you essentially did is text is text. You didn't text me, did you? My phone's not <laughs> Um What you did is, is touch on topics that I was getting ready to cover too, which is talking to your plants, putting your totems out there, also your crystals. I have obsidian lined all the way around my house in my flower beds, which, you know, my flower beds go all the way around my house anyway, so why not put those protective um, crystals out there? there to also make a barrier around your house. Uh, another thing I do is I pray with my plants as I plant them, when I harvest them, I thank them just like you do. Uh, and you know, when I talk to my plants, I don't really care if anybody thinks I'm crazy. Sometimes <laughs> I sing to them. All of this is actually all of this is actually recommended practice in some very common gardening things. And there have even been like childhood um, science experiments where you play different music to the plant and see if the plant grows better under a certain type of more flowy music versus a hard rock heavy metal and there are a, there is a difference in how they grow so do have some kind of living energy in them they respond in turn to your living energy and you'll find the more that you intend to be a good steward to the earth, the more it will apply outside of the garden. You become more conscious of the products you buy. You become more conscious of the food that you eat. Um, it, you know, if you want to start talking about insecticides and, and things like that, it, it wasn't until I started becoming a very conscious gardener that I started steering away from all this chemical stuff. I mean, I had planned on using these things in tinctures, in, in our hoodoo bath supplies, in, you know, in candles and stuff. I don't want all that chemical crap on it, you know, and that's just kind of how it evolves. Um, I had mentioned earlier about, uh, about your earth placements and your water placements. Generally, somehow, you've, you've got water and earth in your chart. I've noticed particularly I have two total earth placements in my chart. But I am known in my family and in my community as somebody that has a green thumb. Those two earth placements are Jupiter and Capricorn and Venus and Virgo, your two benefics. So if you have those two in an earth sign or a water sign, people are probably going to recognize you for your skills in working with this. And if you are the type of person that's kind of Libra that likes to partner with someone else and do gardening work, your husband, your spouse, your kids, your family, what have you, look for those earth placements. I would recommend you look for somebody with Mars and Taurus because I'm a lazy Libra and Mars and Taurus <laughs> Okay, they they are some diggers. Let me tell you, the special talents of Virgo. Well, I don't know if it's a special talent or what, but I have an obsession. Like I said, I have Venus and Virgo. I have this pruning obsession, and every time I hear the term green thumb, I laugh because all summer long my thumb is green because I obsessively deadhead and pinch stuff off and weed, and I'll even come to your yard and do it. And if you're home, I don't care. I'll do it anyway. <laughs> Crazy. I have done that. I have done. I have gone to visit people, and I'm outside pruning their flower gardens while I'm waiting for them to answer the door. And some people don't really like it, you know. But it's <laughs> you can offend people like that. But that is something that Virgo does. Virgo is discriminating. They prune, and in the garden, that's what that equates to. Is is they they can hone right in on what needs to be gone um, out of the garden, and that's just as important as knowing. Um, you know, the after caretaking, the pruning, the harvesting, that sort of thing. The after caretaking is just as important as planning out where you're going to plant, what you're going to plant, and getting ready for all of that. So you want to engage your Virgo for pruning and harvesting. And Virgo season is usually when we do our gardening harvests because that's in the fall, right? Oh, how metaphorical is that? You know, you don't just plant, you need to prune. That's like a life lesson. How... And there's so many metaphorical life lessons, energy lessons, whatever you want to call it, from the whole gardening thing. It's just 
kind of unreal. But yeah, we were sitting there talking about, you know, you've got to prune, you know, and the purpose of deadheading, of course, is to allow that energy in the plant to stimulate new growth. Well, that's kind of the purpose of cutting things out of your life that you don't need or are no longer serving you, too. So I love all of the parallels, and I really encourage anybody who's gardening to, to, to make it a mindful gardening process and start thinking about how is this like my life? You know, what's blooming in my life? What needs to be deadheaded? What's working? What's not? So I really, really love that. I um, love that approach. And I think that it's... Uh, uh, I, I forgot what I, what I was going to follow up with that. <laughs> well, gee, that's never happened before, huh? Imagine that. I mean, we have spells like that where we go absolutely blank. <laughs> Something I'll mention real quick since we were talking about harvesting. Um, I, you know, there there are rules that different people go by. In a season, I never harvest more, and in, this is in terms of herbs, not necessarily vegetables, but more so in terms of flowering plants and herbs. I never harvest more than a third of the plant. Um, and I do so, when I do harvest, I harvest according to the plant's needs. In other words, if there are spent flowers, I will harvest those. If there is a broken branch, I will harvest that. Um, and I always, always, always thank the plant for its contribution for whatever it is I'm getting ready to do to let it know that what I am taking, and that's essentially what you're doing, is taking from the plant. So you should at least say thank you. I mean, if somebody walked up and cut your arm off, they should at least say thank you. <laughs> um, but you need to harvest according to their needs and be thankful and let them know that what you're taking is not going to go to waste. And that being said, in harvesting, if you do have any extras, if you can compost those and give it back to the soil to use instead of letting it go waste, don't send this stuff to the dump, people. Please don't do that. It makes me cry. But, <laughs> you know, try to reuse absolutely everything that you can because that is a body part that you're chopping off and you don't want to chop it off for no good reason. That, you know, that's a really good point and that does remind me of something that I wanted to talk about here, which is when you are taking parts of your plants, particularly herbs, for any kind of magical or energetic use, or to make sachets, or to make yourself a dream pillow, or you know, to use in some kind of charm or talisman or whatever you're doing, um, if you start looking into this, you will see a lot of different rules for how you're supposed to do it. I mean, I've had, I've seen it. Um, asserted that you're supposed to wear white linen and be barefoot and gather herbs at midnight and, you know, not to use this kind of tool or that kind of tool or blah, 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 blah. And I do think, I, you know, if you want to do that, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm not going to be running around in a white linen robe, a white linen robe to collect my plants. Um, the, the advice that you will see not to use metal tools, there is a reason for that. It's because metal is known to um, contain energy. So the thinking behind that is, is that it will um, sap up some of the plant's energy, and you want the plant to be as potent as possible. Um, I don't have a whole lot of rules for how I go about harvesting other than, like Josie said, being respectful of the plant's needs, because the plant is a living thing. In my estimation, with a plant spirit attached to it, and I, I am asking it to lend itself, lend its energy to me to use for whatever purpose that I'm gathering it for. So I will always seek permission. If nobody's around, I will ask out loud. If there are a lot of people there, my neighbors are, you know, think I'm odd enough as it is, so I may not ask real loud, but I will. I will seek permission and let's see if I, I feel a sense of connection and a sense of, okay, I don't mind doing that. I also like to leave something for the plant. Now, some people will just say you can take a little saliva because that's a part of you and rub it on there or leave a little pinch of tobacco. Some people leave dimes, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that my plants really care about dimes or not, uh, but sometimes I will water them with some extra special fertilized water to thank them, or I'll just give a verbal thanks. But 
the, the point being is that you're interacting with the plant and with its energy. So however you go about doing it, whether you offer a prayer or a verbal thanks or a thanks from your heart or you channel a little energy towards the plant to thank it, however you do it, it's very important not to trample these resources because, I mean, that's the kind of energy that you've got going. You know, and if you're collecting these plants to use or whether it's to beautify your house or for protective purposes or whatever, to have the positive, supportive, um, synergistic energy for a, a product for what you're wanting to do throughout the whole process really amplifies its usefulness. And plus, it makes you a decent human being to care about other living things, in my humble opinion. But... Yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to worry too much or excessively about what's the right way to do it. I think that if you act from your heart and you come from a considerate, caring place, that you're probably going to get it right in terms of the plant's usefulness for magical purposes and being respectful of nature. Because you are asking for something from nature. The very least you can do is return a thank you and treat those resources with respect and not wastefully, as George as Josie pointed out. That's my yeah. not so humble opinion. <laughs> well, I love your not so humble opinion and, and you can, you know, as Dixie said, is if you're in an environment where you do not feel comfortable verbally praying with these plants, you can do so energetically. You know, who's to say, you know, what if you've got an established relationship with your plant they're going to be able to pick up on that and I know there are people out going out there saying a good establish a good relationship with a plant <laughs> yes you can and um, and like Dixie said whether your purpose is to beautify your environment or to actually use what do you have in your garden um, as a purpose for other things? Some things, you know, serve double duty, and you may well be pretty surprised if you start looking up some of the things that you currently have in your garden or that you're thinking about putting in your garden about their different uses um, because there is, there is a meaning and there is a use for everything that grows on this earth. And, you know, I think a lot of times that we've forgotten that. But, yes, even the annual flowers that you plant, out in your yard which I try to steer away from because I like to have the the perennials that come back every year but even the annual flowers that you plant in your garden can be used for something um, if nothing more than to bring you enjoyment but they have other purposes as well oh absolutely absolutely and I think that it's um, a great idea to well first of all when you're talking about connecting with your plants and getting their permission when I wanted to make a set of rooms, there are two kind of, I have a big bush in front of my front door that I planted from a little stick, basically, and it's flourished, and I've watered it, and then there's a little tree right next to it, and I was interested in the tree, because that was a little bit more traditional um, in terms of what, what it was, and you know, and I was touching the tree and looking at it and trying to get a feel for it, and I don't think the tree likes me very much. But I leaned over on my bush and I got this just warm rush of very positive kind of loving energy. And I'm like, this bush will make me a nice set of rooms. The tree wants to be left the hell alone, so I left the tree alone. And I took the bush and, and had my rooms made from the bush. And they're awesome. And that's kind of what I look at and whether or not you personally are comfortable with the idea of having a relationship with your plants okay if you're not okay nobody's making you you know but um if you feel warm rushes of energy when you touch your plants when you look at your plants when you care for your plants in my opinion it's not in your head okay not everybody's going to believe that and that's fine that's fine i don't have an issue with it but um yes you can bond with your plants, and it's awesome. And then to go to the other point that Josie just made, um, in terms of looking at what you've got, I think that a garden is best um, planned or whatever. Planned is not the word I want to use. I think that, it, that it's best developed by two things. You can look to choose plants 
that have properties of things that you want to grow in your life. You know, if you want to work on healing, then you can look up what what plants are healing and you know, choose some of those that are right for your climate and blah, blah, blah. But it's also very, very important to look up what the stuff does that's just there. And I'm talking whether or not it's considered weeds or ornamental or whatever. Every plant there is that you can think of, there's some kind of energetic use for. Um, and a really simple way, I mean, it, it, at some point we were going to talk about references, but even before that, there's this concept called the doctrine of signatures in magical thinking, where it's basically the way a plant appears is and you know is connected to its magical use. Um, so if you've got say, if you're growing morning glories and they have the big heart-shaped leaves, that's that's considered connected to love. Um, kidney beans are. Con considered connected to the kidneys energetically and it goes on and on and on and that's where some of these um, correlations come in into to play but I'm excuse me I'm going off on a little tangent here the point being if you are surrounded by stuff look at what you're surrounded by and the, there's a fairly good chance that the stuff you are surrounded by is stuff that would be beneficial for you because that's kind of how this whole web of the universe works so if you absolutely love a particular flower, look up what it means because there's a good chance that it has energy that's very compatible with you or very useful for you. That's a long-winded point I was trying to get to. I got you. I followed you perfectly, and I love the <laughs> points because I get more information than I bargained for in the beginning. Uh, it, I've got a really kind of an odd story. Uh, I've got a <clears> – <throat> we have probably less than a half an acre. Mm -hmm. um, and I live kind of in a suburban area, and it, you know, before you go thinking that all this has to be done on well, acres and acres of ground, you can do any of this gardening stuff in a pot, um, inside or outside. It doesn't really matter. Whatever kind of space you have can accommodate something if you want to grow it. But anyway, in the corner of my yard, I had tried several, several, several different trees. I, I mean, every tree that you could think of, I was trying to grow in this one spot because it was the eastern side of my yard. That's where the sun came up. And I wanted to kind of kind of shade that sun as it came up so it wasn't shining right in my bedroom because that's also the side where my bedroom is. So I had tried all these different trees in this spot. And finally, finally one took off. Um, and we're talking about three years worth of trying here and what that tree was that took off was the curly willow tree and after this was of course before I started any woo woo you know delving into plants and stuff mm -hmm. um, it is actually very compatible with my chart and this tree and I have quite the special relationship in that whenever the moon is full I do go out and talk to it sometimes I talk to it when the moon is not full when I have organic matter left over from making hoodoo bath um, stuff or making plant infusions, I always feed it to that tree. So, you know, it, it, she's right. It, you, when you find the plant that clicks with you, it clicks, man. And this sucker has grown like wildfire since I planted it. As a matter of fact, we had to harvest some of it recently. Turns out that willow wood is actually where they extract, and I'm going to say this wrong, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway, salicylic acid which is the stuff that they make um, aspirin out of. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. underneath the bark of this willow um, are, is a painkiller, which is wonderful for me because at a certain age I started developing arthritis in my hands. So when I would weed or work in the garden, I had to you know, soak my hands or, or take an anti-inflammatory to kind of combat that. I have never, ever had problems with my hands working with willow, and I work with it extensively. I make wands out of it. I've got a little branch here to show you. If you've never seen a curly willow, this is more of a straight branch, uh, mm -hmm. but it, they usually do have bends in them, and they can be rather, you know, like 90-degree bends. They get some really interesting stuff going on in there. I, use, I leave the bark intact when I'm making wands because I like that conduit but if you do want to work with willow and peel the bark back like I said that's going to release that salicylic acid that aspirin ingredient and you know not only are you going to benefit by whatever you're making but your aches and pains are going to be gone by the time 
Um, I will warn you, though, that willow does follow water. They use it as a water divination rod sometimes to find water. You know how they do that with the divination rods. Mm -hmm. That's willow that they use. And it does seek out, out water. And in seeking out water, sometimes its roots finds its way into your sewer drains. So you want to kind of plant away from that sort of thing in a place that has plenty of water preferably deep water so that the roots go down and don't spread out into everybody else's sewer drains in case you have neighbors uh, and that sort of thing. But willow is a wonderful, very diverse uh, tree. They do get kind of big, so you're going to need a little bit of room to plant those in, but you can use them for so many things. It's believed, and I've actually tried this and it has worked, uh, that if you take a few branches of willow that are still attached to the tree. Just kind of take them into your hands and hold them in front of your face and whisper a wish into that willow and then take those branches and braid them together that your wish will come true. Totally worked for me. I don't oh, do it very cool well. Is that? Yeah, it is the coolest thing ever because the the I, I think I've actually done two complete wishes with it and they were very 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 heartfelt um it wasn't like I was wishing to win the lottery. This was, this was actually something very personal, very emotionally attached for me. So you know, the power of that wish being spoken into that willow, and, and then it worked is just, is just amazing. And you know, you can foster that kind of relationship with the stuff you got if you want. Like Dixie said, if you're not comfortable with it, that's cool. I am. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> That's very cool. Well, and a lot of a lot of this this whole thing is is um in in my mind anyway, or for my personal practice, it's treating the plants with respect and with intention. Um, you know, it it is good to be knowledgeable about the nature of the plants, the 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 fact that you know a particular herb was used a particular way. This isn't stuff that somebody's just made up and everybody else copies. It's in tune with the nature of the energy that the plant brings. And so that's why there are books with associations for a particular plant. Because if I'm wanting to do um, some, to bring peace about, I might look at lavender. I'm not going to look at hot pepper. You know, I'm, I'm going to look at spicy, uh, hot stuff if I want to heat up a situation or speed it up or whatever. So looking at the nature of what what you're doing and every every step of the way, um, if I'm if I'm using some of the plants that I respectfully gathered and harvested and whatever, and I want to make up say a sachet that has a particular function with it, I'm going to get I'm going to put as much of my own energy into the process as possible too. I'm going to get a mortar and pestle, and I didn't bring mine over here for a visual aid, so you'll have to have to do with my cupped hands and I'm going to put it in here and if I want it to let using the example of lavender for peacefulness I'm going to put my lavender flowers in and if I'm going to crush them up I'm going to bring it to the I'm going to do clockwise circles because I'm wanting to increase so I'm going to circle to the right and I'm going to be speaking to the spirit of lavender while I'm doing it I'm going to be praying for what I want while I'm doing it I'm going to visualize energy coming down and going through my hands and into the plant that whole process is going to be a magical act so ideally if you're growing your plants for some of this in your magical garden from the time you you know pick out a space and say okay you know I want you to nurture my beautiful plants and you plant them and you're like okay I'm going to put lots of love and energy and peace peaceful feelings, I'm going to think about those things, I'm going to talk about those things while I'm planting, while I'm caring for it, while I'm picking it, while I'm working it, and into whatever finished product that I'm going to put it in, that plant will carry all those intentions, all that thought, all that energy from the whole time that you do it. So it's much more powerful than, you know, something that you picked up from the side of the road. It really makes it special, and every time you look at it, you're also going to bring the thought energy of all of the time that you've spent loving that plant and caring for that plant with you. So it's kind of a really powerful, personal, awesome process. I mean, Josie was talking about her willow tree. She would probably like another willow tree that she saw elsewhere, but it's 
the experience of interacting with that particular tree is going to be so much more powerful for her because of how long it took for it to grow and the relationship that she's developed with it. And I had no idea we were going to end up talking about personal relationships with our plants. I really didn't. I did not see it going this direction. You never know what we're going to end up with. Well, you know, I've got a lot of Pisces, so I, I had personal relationships with my stuffed animals. Any kind of inanimate object, you know, I can make friends with a rock, but, you know, plants are a little bit different. They're actually living things. And Dixie hit the nail right on the head as far as your intentions being carried in the energy of that plant. Um, not only are they carried in the energy of that plant, but your intentions grow with that plant. You know, so it, it's the fruit that it bears. You know, if you if you plant and it, if you infuse an intention of wanting to make delicious desserts for your family into that apple tree, you're basically infusing an apple tree with love. So the fruits that that apple tree bears are going to contain that love and um, you know and it's just little things like that you, why wouldn't you want to do it I, I mean you know because it does physically manifest you talk about bringing as above so below I mean it's right there in front of you growing and you can see the products of your labor almost immediately so it to me that makes a big difference and you also talked about lavender and you touched a little bit on where uh, choosing a place to plant your lavender somehow and I don't really know maybe I had a candle or some some essential oil or something but somehow I discovered that the smell of lavender is actually my husband's kryptonite at the time he was working <laughs> it really is um, like he smells it and he's boom, total relax almost instantly so at the time he was kind of working a stressful job so what I did was plant the lavender right at my front doorstep sometimes when I would get home before he would I would go out and spritz it with water because that that water would activate the scent a little bit so what he would encounter as soon as he walked up the front steps was the smell of this lavender that automatically helped him relax and release the weight of the day that he may be carrying around and come home and have a relaxing evening. I didn't tell him about it until about a year or so later, but you know, it worked. And you know, things like that. What do you want the front door of your home to say? Do you want it to say this is a loving and welcoming place? Do you want nobody to knock on the door? Because you could put a cactus out there. You know, people mm -hmm. see this big prickly cactus out front of your door. They're not gonna come knocking too often because people do pay attention to that kind of thing whether they do it consciously or subconsciously they do pay attention but whatever energy you want people to have as they enter your home look at your plants you know and put those out there and, and and they all do have a specific type of meaning and that type of meaning grows with the plant so let's uh, let me look through here and see kind of what I have as far as notes say you wanted to um, Say you wanted your people to wipe their feet before they came in. Buttercups grow neatness. Buttercups are really pretty. <laughs> and they're yellow. And, you know, you want people to respect your home when they enter your home as far as being neat and tidy after themselves. Not that I'm talking to any particular Virgos in the room. But <laughs> what you can do is plant buttercups outside in pots or actually in the ground. And that will grow neatness, organization things. Um, also humility uh, and it kind of vanquish it kind of vanquishes some of the childishness you know so if you have somebody that's going to be coming over um, and that's rather childish they may lose that quality as they notice the the buttercups at your front door one that I particularly wanted to talk about because for a very long time I really did not like these plants are marigolds and I don't know why I don't know why I had an adverse reaction to them as a child, but for some reason I did. But I have started incorporating them back into my gardens. And the reason that I did is because marigolds are natural insect repellents. Um, if you ever paid attention to vegetable gardens, like the old-fashioned vegetable gardens, um, you will often see marigolds, marigolds planted in those. Also, people used to plant morning glories with their corn so that vine would go up around the corn and kind of stabilize the stalk. But the reason that they put those marigolds in there is because deers don't like them and also because they do repel bugs. 
Um, what I have found though is number one, they are really easy to propagate. They grow really simply. You can't, it's kind of, they're kind of hard to kill. I think they must have some Pluto in them because I haven't killed one yet. Um, they were used as love charms. The blooms, the actual blossoms, were worn as love charms and used as love charms. Um, they uh, have been used in rituals and worn, worn as talismans for you know centuries. Um, they are also there's a legend that says people would the more impoverished people of the community would gather marigolds and give them as an offering to Virgin Mary and they did that because they didn't have the money to give her real gold and yet these flowers were so golden that they would offer them to her as a bounty and that's how they got the name marigold Mary gold um, and that's kind of where that came from it to Plus, there's a bountiful harvest with them at the end of the year. Of course, marigolds are an annual. The seeds are actually in the bloom. So when that bloom starts to fade and dry, you can cut the entire thing out and dry those seeds out and replant them next year. Even if you don't do that, even if you just let the plant go and let it die, it will reseed itself. It's not an annual, or it is an annual, it's not a perennial. But it will reseed itself just by those blooms falling off on the ground. So it's it's one of those really simple things. I like it because it goes pop when you deadhead it. <laughs> it just comes right off. I love that. Um, but you know they also have uses. They it, I've got it written right here that marigold flowers added to pillows, which like she was talking about a sachet or you know adding it in into something. Marigolds added into an into a sachet placed under your pillow or actually in the actual pillowcase itself. It's said that that can enhance prophetic or psychic dreams. Well, I didn't read that until today, so you know I'm going to give that a shot. I already have a willow <laughs> branch that sits next to my bed because that is also supposed to help with clairvoyance and what have you. And I can attest that yes, my dreams have been much more clear um, and much more on point with the willow than it was before. So I'm gonna give Marigold a try and stick it under my um, under my pillow. But they make wonderful gifts because like I said, it, you, you can take them and wrap them in a little sachet and attach them to a package that you're giving away as a gift. People actually like that stuff. I thought I was the only weirdo that liked that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I gotta tell you, people really respond to stuff like that. Um, they like that you that that you give that earthy kind of present to them and they you know it gives them something to do it's not just a knickknack or anything but they make really good presents and like I said you have such a bountiful harvest at the end of the year with them that you can pretty much share them with the entire neighborhood if you'd like and if you are looking to do any kind of abundance work or any kind of prosperity work plants that are prolific are great for that or, or fruits are that. When, when I was looking at things for today's show, a couple of things that I looked at were um, fruits and vegetables, you know, stuff that we don't usually think about in terms of magic because they still do have magical associations, as we've said, kind of everything does. Zucchini is well known for abundance or prosperity work because it's so prolific. Um, or, or stuff, for example, um, you know, everyday herbs, can, can be used for various things. Basil um, was one of the ones that, that I was thinking about because it's um, considered helpful for joy. Um, I'm, I'm jumping from the abundance to, to other things, but helpful for joy. At one time it was, you know, it was used as a, they made wreaths out of it and people wore them when they were getting married to um, to ensure happiness, marital happiness. So you've got you've got like everyday kind of things, and you look at um, look at the smells. You look at okay, does it produce a whole lot? Well, then it's probably helpful for bringing something into abundance. Um, but yeah, I I I'm going to have to try some willow now and marigold under my own pillows because I did not know that. That's one of the things I love about doing yeah. the shows with Josie is like I learn stuff too. You know, we learn stuff from each other. 
I don't know. I really do, and, and I, I feel like it's a mutual learning experience. And and um, it, it, sometimes I'll be reading my notes and stuff when you talk, but most of the time I'm right on the screen listening. You know, trying to see what it is that you're covering because we really don't discuss this beforehand. But actually, with the willow, they did make you, you know, if you slice the branch um, this way, mm -hmm. and make kind of like a coin circle. People actually wore those um, in order to enhance their willow properties which would be clairvoyance and also um, um, in connection with your emotional body it also helps with that because willow isn't so in tune with water um, it also can enhance that so yeah I mean there's all kinds of uses out there I, one of the ones that I looked up was the poppy <clears throat> which I think mm -hmm. we all know what the poppy does from the symbolism that we see in the Wizard of Oz when they fall asleep in the poppy field and that is kind of that's kind of what it's representative as, you know, we make our opiates out of out of opium poppies, uh, and we all know that those make you rather loopy and knocked out. That's where all your narcotics come from, um, or they used to before we had all this chemical crap going on. But poppies were used by the by the Egyptians to decorate burial tombs, and it was kind of in order to give the person who had died a peaceful sleep or a peaceful passage and that's what they're associated with they're great to have in a backyard garden because they do enhance that peaceful um, you know kind of soft feeling the petals are very delicate they're really easy on the eye and um, I do have some growing this year I'm going to try to keep all the teenagers in the neighborhood from smoking it that may be a little bit hard because you know how they are but um, Poppies are a great plant to have around. Another one that I looked, well, I didn't look this one up, I didn't need to, was rose. Uh, mm -hmm. Roses are very common. Most, you know, most outdoor gardens, you probably have a rose planted somewhere. Wild roses are a little bit different. The wild, old-fashioned roses are a little bit different than the ones that have been created for today. You know, like your tea roses and your more fragrant roses. Uh, wild roses, what they will do is give you a little bit uh, what I like to call Uranian power, a little bit of gypsy power to where you feel free to ramble and go about on your own. They also will give you confidence. Uh, traditional roses or old fashioned roses are kind of hard to find unless you don't live, unless you live in a rural setting. We still have them growing wild here in Kentucky and I'm sure that there are some more rural, rural places that also have them growing. But most people have uh, you know like the tea roses and the more fragrant hybrid type things and the petals from the roses can be used for lots of things I you know of course they they are said to enhance fertility that is why they were traditionally sprinkled either on after the bride walks down the aisle or on the actual wedding bed and they're very romantic of course someone gives you a red rose that's supposed to symbolize that they love you um, and there's different symbolism for the different colors and the theories on those different colors differ from people to people so you know on that point I would have to tell you just to defer your gut what I actually do with my rose um, petals after they're spent, I'll separate them from that little bud. Um, and then, you know, I may charge them under the full moon. I may spread them around my candle when I have it burning just to kind of charge them a little bit. Of course, you can use them um, with your candle magic like we discussed on several previous shows. Mm -hmm. But what I like to do is kind of do an infusion and get a little bit of water, add some rose petals to it, and a little bit of sea salt or Epsom salt. Boil that, strain it. I take my organic product that's left over and I feed it back to the earth. Then I'll take that water and I'll drop a couple of little rose quartz crystals in it. And what that's great for is, you know, if you're feeling kind of dejected, not loved, having a bad day, you can put that rose water, which is an actual thing, you know, I'm not talking about making um, rose oil extract or anything like that, this is just something simple that you can do in your kitchen, but you can take that rose water infusion and apply it to your pulse points here, here behind your knees, and it's almost like an instant mood pick-me-up. It also attracts love. 
um, you know, it, it, and what it does in that instance, especially with the rose quartz, is kind of boost your self-love a little bit. I also like to take some of it sometimes and put it in my bath water, maybe even sprinkle a few rose petals in there with it. It's a personal indulgence that you can do. Like I said, boosts your self-love, which in turn makes you more loving to others, and that's kind of how the love grows and spreads, and all of that is available from a common rose bush. You can look to the, symbol the symbolism of the different colors and decide, you know, perhaps the yellow one. Yellow is more sunshine and happiness type thing. Um, it, you know, if you're low, you can use the yellow rose petals. You can also use them if you're given roses as gifts. <clears throat> I have saved my rose petals from roses that were given to me as gifts and made this same infusion. You just want to be really careful that those were not dyed roses because when you make the infusion, that dye is going to come out in the water and it's going to color whatever you put it on. So, you know, if you have someone that has given you roses and you can tell they haven't been dyed, it was given to you as a gift of love, what better way to use it than that, you know, is to extend that meaning after the flowers have faded and do something a little bit extra special for yourself. I like that, um, and I also like the um, the idea of the the intention of the gift, kind of carrying that on. And I also use like to use my my flowers in my oils, some oil that I've made and it's been under the moon that I used before readings. And I have a lot of plant material that are kind of related or are related to that. One of my favorites that I want to make sure that I I mention. Um, before we go, because I know we're going to have to wind up here pretty soon, is rosemary, too, because it's so helpful for so many things. And rosemary, I thought it had, okay, yeah, it means do, see, is the name of it, but it's used for mental clarity, it's used for protection, it's used for memory, it's used for um, psychic communication, it's just such a multi-use plant. And what, one of the things that it always makes it, or that I particularly enjoy about it, it's especially associated with feminine protection. So in, in the old times, um, it used to be said that if a rosemary plant was growing in the garden, um, that it was also a sign of feminine dominance. It meant the wife was in charge of the house. And so the legend is that men used to pull up the rosemary plant so that there were the people in town would not think that their wives were in charge. So that that's kind of a funny little thing. I don't know how true that is, but you can, you know, you can put sprigs by your door to protect yourself from negative energy. It's also said to protect against theft. So there's all kinds of things you can do. I love rosemary. It's kind of like a workhorse of essential oils because there's so many different things. But there is some scientific backing for the rosemary helping memory because it's said to activate your learning centers in your brain, the smell of rosemary. I see a lot of this kind of stuff. I think, okay, the science has to catch up with the magic, in, in my opinion. But there, there are so many that we could talk about. We could probably talk about this for months and not get all of them done. One thing that I was hoping to do before we finished up was um, mention some potential references because as you can tell we are just scratching the surface of what you can do with this and the big part is to have some idea of where to start and also be able to, to follow up. I brought a couple of my books so I'm going to hit these real quick. Um, if you're just starting with any kind of magical gardening stuff if you look in terms of Scott Cunningham, anything by Scott Cunningham is going to be pretty accessible and he has good information. Um, so this is incense oils and brews, but you can do a lot of that. If you want a whole bunch of correspondences, this is a book that I just got recently that is awesome. It does plants, it does trees, it does you know, all kinds of references. This is Llewellyn's complete book of correspondences cross-reference, so this is an awesome, awesome resource. And if you're interested uh, more in some of the magical uses, this book by Catherine Ironwood, Hoodoo, Herb, and Root Magic, it has a lot of old-time spells, many of which I would not ever use because some of them are a little darker than I would prefer to go, but um, a lot of lore about the plants, a lot of, of authentic hoodoo stuff. And it's a really great resource. 
on common use of plants, um, various you know botanical stuff that you may not find other places. So those are some of my favorites. Josie, do you have any that you wanted to pop in there? I do. I, I have three total. The first one is, of course, the Farmer's Almanac, which you can now find all kinds of tools online with the Farmer's Almanac to look for things that are compatible in your area. You can call your county extension agent. They are very helpful with things that grow well in your zone, and they have a lot of knowledge to give you about local varieties of wild flowers and such that you can find if you're into wild crafting, which is something that we did not even touch on, but is is something that's a lot of fun. Um, again, you need to have the responsibility and kind of the conscious mindset in order to do that, but you can explore more into that. And the County Extension Office is an excellent place to get information about where you can find whatever you're looking for. Also, there's this dude named Edward Bach that you may have heard of. <laughs> in the 1930s, he gave up a very good um, doctorate practice and began to explore the teachings of I know I'm going to say this wrong. Paracelsus, para, is that right? Paracelsus, P A R A C E L S U S, who was a magician who worked with herbs. And what Edward Bach's work eventually ended up producing are the Bach flower essences, your your stress remedy relief, and all that stuff that you can now go to CVS and Walmart and buy. That's where it came from, was from this Edward Bach guy. So you can always research the Bach flower essences and find out what would be good to grow in your garden. I have a book that I would also like to reference, and it is called Sacred Smoke by Harvest McCampbell. It looks like this. Um, and what Harvest has done is she goes through and, and talks about the different Native American techniques as far as planting and harvesting, and she touches upon the meanings of and the reasons why she chooses certain herbs to smudge with and whatever. So if you're looking to grow a plant that you can smudge with, you know, be it white sage, which is the most common, you can smudge with other things too. And she outlines this in her book completely. So, you know, on... Um, on Dixie's site, I know she has an Amazon link, so you can go to that link and, and check out any of these books on Amazon. This is where I got this one. Um, and also, you can do quite a bit of research on Bach Flower Essences on Amazon, too, because they have descriptions of them all right there. Great, great resources. Um, and I hadn't even thought about Bach Flower Essences. That's awesome. That is awesome. You do need to know that you can visit Josie or I at our individual sites. Our site for the show is woowonderful.com. Um, but Josie and I both offer private one-on-one -on -one consultations. You are welcome to, to give us a holler. I am at afoolsjourney.com. And Josie is at your, your shop. shop therapist at blogspot.com um, and, and that's that's on blogger so um, just look up your shock therapist and I promise you I have I have never hooked electrodes up to anyone yet you could very <laughs> well, but no really it's not like that <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for coming and hanging out with us and spending time if you have comments or whatever, leave them wherever you find this video, let us know what you think or what you might like us to talk about in the future because we're, we're real open to that. We have an awesome time and we hope you did too. I did. I had a great time. We hope to see you back next time. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.